Welcome to the Cable Business Journal. I am Richard Reisman, your host and publisher of the Orange County Business Journal. Our guest today, Jim McClooney, is the CEO of Emulex Corporation, headquartered in Costa Mesa. Approaching $500 million in annual sales, Emulex is growing at a double-digit clip. Welcome to the show, Jim. Hi. Thanks, Richard. Good to be here. Why don't we just start the show by asking you to just explain to our viewers, what does Emulex do? Well, we're in the business of supplying some fairly uh, advanced high-tech products, both hardware and software, that allows data centers around the world to move data at high speed between the server that's running an application to storage that's on a network somewhere. Or perhaps it would be helpful if you gave an example. Yeah, well, think about um, maybe you're ordering a movie from home. Okay. And you get on your computer and uh, you, you, you're going out over the internet mm -hmm. and you get into your favorite uh, movie store. Well, that's probably going over an ethernet network somewhere that's being switched and routed into a web server that recognizes okay. who you are mm -hmm. and it recognizes um, what kind of movie you're looking for. And there'll be a piece of technology in there that will take that data and route it at high speed to the server and storage that's got the movie there. And All right, so the server communicates to the storage. Com communicates to the storage, the movie's on a piece of storage somewhere. Right, right, right. And then it says, yeah, we've got that. Mm -hmm. Now in between times, they kind of want you to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So there's another command comes in and it says, uh, who are you? It will go to another web server that will have um, perhaps a fiber channel based network which has got a database behind it that's got all your personal account information that says you've early, we recognize you, we have an account here, or route that back. And the fiber channel, is that's your product? That's our product, but we're also in Ethernet now. now so we're are. kind of straddling both networks, mm -hmm. and it does it at very, very high speed, and it sends the information back, says, yes, this is all paid for, and then this, the Ethernet network and IP network starts downloading the movie to you. Mm -hmm. So you can apply the same thing when you go to an ATM to take cash out, various networks behind it. So our components, um, essentially offload all the hard work from the processor to route that data to storage where mm -hmm. all the information is, whether that's a movie or whether that's your personal information. A and it does it fast, so you don't have to wait really and wait fast, and wait. And it, and it does it accurately so that it doesn't, get you, it doesn't charge you a, uh, $80, it only charges you $8 yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly, it's, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's been very, very robust technology. It's been around for a couple of decades now. Well, the fiber channel was kind of the technology that I think launched... I mean, Emulex was around, but Fiber Channel was the original technology that uh, built the company up. Is that correct? Well, no, actually, the company's been around for about 30 years. Uh, long presence here. Um, probably in the last 15 years, they got into Fiber Channel. Right. We saw that as the next real emerging trend. Uh, I've been at the company shorter than that, mm -hmm. um, probably in the last eight years, but... Um, the company became very, very strong in fiber channel. It was in very early, in the, in the mid to late 90s, mm -hmm. caught a wave of a very disruptive technology mm -hmm. that people were looking to implement. Okay, so we'll talk about Emulex in the early years, before fiber channel. It was a smaller company. Fiber channel's kind of uh, accelerated its growth, didn't it? Well, actually, yeah, it was a smaller company. It was a big company, then the technology it had went out, and uh, many, many lives over the last 30 years. Uh, it's, it goes up and down. It goes up and down, and um, then they saw this emerging fiber channel, which gave it tremendous growth in the early, early 2000s, mm -hmm. when the technology took off, and uh, now we're looking at the next wave of growth. For, for, the, for the company for the next decade. Okay, so Fiber Channel was one of the ups on the roller coaster. Yep. And so the next up on the roller coaster is what? The current, the current up. The current up is, uh, <laughs> we, we, there's another kind of networking protocol called Ethernet. Mm -hmm. It's very ubiquitous in the data center. Just about everybody, even from your laptop through to any network in the data center uses Ethernet. To right, so in my office, my laptop is connected to a server by Ethernet. Exactly, mm -hmm. and when you're surfing the web or there, it's probably an also. IP and Ethernet network mm -hmm. there. And it's moving to, to uh, speeds that are 10 times what was historically there. Mm -hmm. And the industry was looking for ways to make Ethernet just as reliable as the fiber channel network we just talked about. Fiber channel was always more reliable. Always more reliable. That was your advantage when you... That was the advantage. Now, now I moved over to this Ethernet network and we said, well, here's an opportunity for Emulex because we know how to manage storage. We know about reliability. We have the right technology. And, um, but it's a much broader market for us. So we are starting to really see the benefit of some probably investments we made over the last three, four years mm -hmm. to get into this emerging market. And we see trends that can propel our growth 
you know, at least for the next three, four, five years. Now, it's interesting that in Fiber Channel, uh, it turned out that you and another Orange County company, QLogic, right. which were actually once siblings, but that's, that's part of history. Right. But the, you two dominated that market, and, and still, that's your main business, and you continue to compete with QLogic, and you two are the biggest competitors. Uh, no one else is nearly as large as either of you in that, in in that, that market. In that, in that, in that market. That's true. Now, in the, in, in the new technology you're getting involved with, the Ethernet, you have different competitors, is that right? That's true. You know, we've got companies like Intel and Broadcom who are very, very strong competitors. Well, Broadcom's, in another, again, you're competing with another home team company, but no, Intel's is the North team. <laughs> well, the, the interesting, I'd, probably people don't know this, but between uh, ourselves, Q, and Ethernet, Orange County is quite a bastion of networking. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, the, there's a lot of the market share is, is in these three companies, and it's mm -hmm. here locally. For us. And we compete with each other, which is, which is fine, but uh, the, there's a strong presence here in this kind of networking and interconnect business. Well, and this is part of your diversification, too, now that you're getting into this Ethernet. Why don't you talk about how this is part of the diversification strategy at Emulex? Yeah, well, this, this indeed was, was to move into adjacent markets and things we know about. Yes. There's other, with Ethernet, because it's more ubiquitous, there's other areas that we're, we're off looking at. Like, um, you know, the very people that are driving cloud computing and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and services, uh, we're looking at, you know, perhaps how can we make the, the, the network easier to manage? You know, it's quite complicated. It's getting more complicated. Tools. Tools that, that, that customers can use. Mm -hmm. So these are areas we're looking at. To, uh, data security has become a big issue. And you weren't in that area, but you get it, you're area. moving into that area. Moving into that area. So we're very innovative. There's things we grow ourselves. There's things that we might acquire, you know, through other companies. So we're always looking at what the trends are over the next three to five years and investing in them. And you just cannot stand still. And you're telling Wall Street you expect to grow in the double digits going forward? Yeah, I mean, this, this calendar year, we could grow 13 14% year over year, which mm -hmm. is about four times the pace of IT spending. So uh, Wall Street's starting to get that and mm -hmm. understand what we're doing, and we'll hope to repeat it next calendar year as well. And to the home folks here, you actually have been hiring people locally? Yeah, we hired, um, <laughs> we hired about 50 people last year. That's not bad. Which is not bad for if us. everyone did. You know, it all great. adds up and we're going to continue with hiring and uh, always looking for skills coming out of our colleges and, and, uh, and, and things like that. So we love hiring people. It's great. And, and you're up to close to 400 people in Orange County? Yeah, close to 400 so people. So hiring 50 is a significant increase. Yeah. yeah. And altogether, what, about how many employees do you have and where else do you have facilities besides Orange County? We have about another 150 people up in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. uh, and we have people abroad. Uh, we have... Um, but 150 people in, in India. So all in all, by the time you, you know, include our sales and marketing guys and, and, and customer support, we're just under 1,000 people worldwide. Okay, and uh, why don't we segue uh, from Emulex for a moment into the Jim McClooney story. Hmm. You grew up um, in Brooklyn? No, no, Scotland. Slightly east of Brooklyn. <laughs> Scotland. Scotland. So when you were a young lad in Scotland, was it always your dream to run an American high-tech company? Didn't even cross my mind. No. No, no. Like, like a lot of kids then, I either wanted to be a soccer player or some kind of movie star. Or well, What happened to your soccer player career? Or well, your movie star career? It didn't go very far. No? <laughs> I found I couldn't play soccer and I wasn't a good actor. So, oh. so I decided, well, I better get, better get a job to do. Yeah. <laughs> So you went to university went instead to university of uh, in Glasgow. a celebrity? Yep. Glasgow went to university and you studied. And, uh, early on, I'd gone, my, my dad used to invite me to the, the company he worked for. Uh -huh. And um, I, I started getting fascinated about how companies worked. Yeah. You know, how raw materials can come in one side and finished products come out the other. And, mm -hmm. and all these people do things. So I always had that fascination for that. So when I, I when like I, the black box. It just... I don't know what happens in there. Oh, well, I like to see what's happening in the black box. <laughs> you know, just lift the lid That's on I'm a it. publisher. Try not to break it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took a business degree, it, it, um, studied economics and business and, and mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, the workings of companies and, and that kind of thing. It was quite fascinating. And what was your first job coming out of college? Or well, university? The university, well. In, in Britain. In, in those days, interestingly enough, going into the automotive industry was a great place to learn your trade. And yeah. I joined a company fresh from college called British Leyland, okay. which was Talk a kind that. of conglomerate of different brands mm -hmm. back then. That's that, some of the brands were? Oh, Jaguar, Triumph, MG, 
uh, the London taxis, mm -hmm. trucks and buses, that kind of Austin Rover. Yeah. You know, some very famous brands there. And I don't hear much about British Leyland these days. Uh, they disappeared a long time ago. People brought up the, bar the brands. It, it was heavily nationalized in those days and lost a lot of its innovative edge, even with those great brands. And so in fact, companies, companies like BMW, Audi, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, bought some of the brands and others. Right. And um, I've done great things with them. Mm -hmm. But um, it was so funny. I, rem I remember my first day there. They, they had me on this kind of um, management development course. And uh, they said, well, Jim, I, well, I could say with a Scottish accent, but the viewers wouldn't follow. But uh, they said, you're, you're probably a kind of smart laddie, but we're going to assume you know absolutely nothing. And we're going to teach you about things. And I spent at least nine months a year going through every different department and how to make a truck, a bus, a car. You know, went into accounting, uh, sales, marketing. Does that training serve you today? Oh, it served me well. Oh, good. You, you get to you get to learn what uh, how things work. Mm -hmm. You get to talk to real people who are doing different mm -hmm. jobs and what mm -hmm. makes them, you know, gets them excited. What motivates them? And um, it's taught me to take nothing for granted. How long were you there? I was there about eight years. Okay, and then you went where? High tech. Okay, good. And I uh, heard of this are. company uh, called Digital Equipment Corporation. Right. They had a manufacturing facility in the west coast of Scotland. And it's an American-based company. American-based company out mm -hmm. of Massachusetts. That's where mm -hmm. it was headquarters. I joined right. there and um, it was very exciting, very entrepreneurial, very different from the automotive industry. And I just got so caught up in it. I thought it was fantastic. Well, Ken Olson, I think, is an iconic name associated with that company, isn't it? Very famous guy. And he kind of reinvented computing, you know, from big mainframes into what they called mini computers. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. in between the PC and the biggest ones. Yeah. And that it, was once it, a huge category. Huge category. It didn't quite catch the PC trend. Right. But it, it, it brought very, very powerful computers into uh, very focused applications. Yeah. And uh, it was growing like crazy. Uh, I learned a lot about entrepreneurialism there and taking risks and that kind of thing. It was, it was fascinating. Did you ever have contact with Ken Olson? Yeah. Occasionally we would. We'd have, um, we'd have meetings where we talked about, uh, you know, the strategy of the company and where it was going. And um, they moved me from Scotland to Switzerland, I spent okay. three years in Geneva. And then they said, no, you've got to come over to Massachusetts. And, and that's the first time you live in the United States? Yeah. Okay. I was on the East Coast there and uh, spent about eight years in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was interesting. They, they, um, I learned a lot about uh, dealing with international issues there. They would have me travel to Asia, Japan, Australia, India. You know, because we had manufacturing and operational facilities there, and that, mm -hmm. that was great. Well, Digital Came Equipment in. or DEC is a great company, but you left DEC and went to a company that is even more iconic, even better known, which was? Apple Computer. Apple Computers. I think this might be a good time to take the break, and we'll talk more about Apple Computers and, and Emulex and your career and other issues after the break. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. Jim, when we took the break, we mentioned the fact that you were at DEC or digital equipment mm -hmm. and you moved over to Apple. Uh, explain the circumstances of that move. Yeah, well, there was a, a next DEC guy who was actually running all the worldwide operations at Apple and they gave me a call one day and said, hey, Jim, we're looking for, for somebody to run our uh, European operations. Okay. And I said, oh, oh, what's that about? He says, oh, it's a tough assignment. You'll have to go to Paris. Mm. So I went, hmm. That took about 10 seconds to figure out that that may be a good thing. So, yeah. uh, you know, after a lot of discussion, we, we went there. Uh, I, I moved to Paris with the family and we ran, uh, I ran De uh, Apple's European operation for a couple of years. And this is when Steve Jobs was, you know, in the wilderness. He was wilderness. off doing other things. He, yeah. was, he was in the wilderness. So and, Gil um, Emilio was there then. And Gil, County Gil joined right. while I was in Europe and I got a call from him one day and he says, hey, Jim, will you come over to Cupertino? Okay. And say to run our, our global operation. And I said, great, I'd love to do that. So we, we moved up and uh, moved over to the, the Bay Area to you run Apple. to nice places. Yeah. Including now. Yeah, that was nice. Mm -hmm. And um, probably not long afterwards, actually, um, Steve came back to the company. Right. Took, and, uh, took back the helm. Took back the helm there. So I worked for Steve for a while, which was quite interesting. Well, it must be. I, I think a lot of people be fascinated. What, 
What are some of your anecdotes you have of working with Steve Jobs? He's a, such a legend. Yeah, well, I'll never forget the first day he appeared. The executive team was kind of in the, the and boardroom. And you reported directly to him? Yeah, and um, he came in and he had his kind of archetypal kind of polo shirt on, mm-hmm. like seven days of beard growth, a pair of shorts, and starts talking about what's wrong with Apple. Mm-hmm. And he basically said, well, what's wrong? And I said, well, the products are kind of boring. And he said, absolutely. We need to get more sex back in this company. Yeah. Which wasn't what I was thinking of, but he translated it into, we need to start making products that consumers really love. And that's exactly what that's Apple's exactly what known for. That's exactly what he set about doing, you know? Mm-hmm. So he was, uh, any, anything else about the impressions he made on you while you were there? Um, very powerful leader. Powerful. Uh, um, very focused on what he thought was right. Um, just roll over obstacles. You know, if, 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 if there was some technology that we couldn't get to work, he would say, well, forget about that. We'll just design that out. We'll go do this thing. It's totally different. So he was, he was such a visionary and, and, and had such an idea of what people wanted that he got laser-like focus, very maniacal in what needed to be done and drove his team that way. And you, you were in charge of operations, which yeah. is not usually thought of as one of his strengths. You know, he's... Uh, design, marketing, design, uh, uh, understanding uh, what's the next trends, trend, right? But so, so you were can, actually in a position where you were expert in an area. He didn't feel he knew more than you did. Yeah, he was. It was quite interesting. He, he, we had a kind of deal going that he said, "Hey, Jim, you run this operational stuff, uh-huh. please, and and uh, you know, don't get on my radar screen mm-hmm. and let me concentrate on everything else." And that's that's kind of how how it went. You now, know? He had a reputation good. too of of, of not always being tactful with people. He might call someone stupid, for instance. Yeah, well, probably in Steve's parlance, stupid would be a term of endearment. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it got um, worse than that, He huh? got, got worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, he didn't tolerate fools very, very much, and uh, he always knew where he was coming from, and, and some people could take it, some couldn't, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, uh, but... Were you one of the people who couldn't take it? No, I, I actually got on with them extremely well. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, and we, coming into the company, I let them know this, that um, I'd been at very large corporations all my working life since then. Right, right. College, and I thought, I want to do a startup. And here I am in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. I had some buddies that were of the same mind, and we had been working on financing a, a startup. And uh, actually, interesting enough, it was in fiber channel-based storage stuff way okay, back so, then. So you left Apple to go to this other company, not yep. because of any issues with Steve no, Jobs? No, none, none whatsoever. And you didn't know he'd become an icon at that time. He was just Steve Jobs, uh, another, another CEO. Well, I knew he was a great guy, yeah. you know, his reputation before. But uh, uh, I explained to him, I said, I need to do this. You know, I'm, I'm it, a lot, I was a lot older than him, and there's some things you just need to do. Uh, so and, tell us uh, how you went about to do the startup and... We, fi- we financed it, we, we got it going, and uh, started recruiting people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was uh, some changes in the market, and there was a large company, was an investor in the company. In a, that in was one startup. of the original investors. It was, a, strategic so a strategic investor. investor, not a financial one. And they picked up their option to buy the company, and we went, well, okay, let's do that. So they acquired us. Mm-hmm. And, um, so you had a payday. We had a payday, and then about 90 days later, it didn't, quite work out the way they wanted, not for anything we were doing, Mm -hmm. but really they had to change the strategy. So we said, okay, we'll we'll take our IP back. We relaunched the company. And uh, restarted the startup. Restarted Mm -hmm. the startup. And uh, I I, I don't know if this is a world record or not, but we managed to sell the same startup with the same IP and the same people twice in a 12-month period. Well, usually that's a good thing. It's a good thing for your bank account. Good thing for the bank account. Good thing for the people, actually, as it turned out. Would for loved, everybody. Would I love to have taken the company to IPO, but it, uh, I, I did that later in my career. But um, it, it was fun. Actually, the, we sold the, the second company to another local Orange County company, Western Digital. Is that right? Yeah, Chuck Haggerty was the CEO at the time. Right. Uh, he said, I want to buy a company. Mm. And he, I said, well, okay, let's talk. And we reached an agreement. And um, he tried to uh, convince me to join Western Digital, and mm-hmm. I said, well, Chuck, I'm not a drive guy. I know about systems, and he was on the board of another company that was based up in, um, up in north of Seattle, mm-hmm. in Washington. Mm-hmm. And he said, we're looking for a new CEO. Would you want to, to have a look at that? And, okay, and you I didn't said, want to go to Western Digital. You didn't think it was a good fit. Not but good he fit suggested this other company on which he served on the board. Yeah, he mm-hmm. did, and they were looking for a new CEO, and mm-hmm. I said, I, I studied it. I kind of knew about them. Because once again, they were in that kind of fiber channel storage networking realm. Did you use Steve Jobs as a reference? Actually, the board phoned Steve. 
Oh, did and they? they they said, "Would you recommend this guy?" He said, "Yeah." He took I would. the call. He took the call, okay. and they said, "Yeah," which I thought was pretty cool. It's very cool. And um, so, um, my first job with well, the company was called Vixel. Was uh, about six months after I joined, I took it public. We did an IPO, okay. uh, which was very interesting. I'd never done anything of like that before. Mm -hmm. And then I got uh, acquired by Emulex. Then we went through the first major technology meltdown. Uh -oh. In 2000, 2001, yeah, so I yeah. completely retooled the company, took it in a different direction, mm -hmm. and we created some products that no one had ever done before, mm -hmm. um, that, that went into major uh, uh, hard disk drive storage subsystems. Mm -hmm. Emulex liked the look of what we were doing, mm -hmm. and I got a call one day from Paul Folino, who was the CEO of Emulex at yeah. the time, and said, hey, Another iconic figure. Another, another local iconic figure, mm -hmm. and said, uh, hey would like to buy a company, what do you think? And we talked for a bit and said, yeah, let's do it. Well, what can you, talk, what can you say about Paul? As, you know, you've worked with Olsen and Jobs. What can you say about Paul? You know, Paul would, uh, came in at an amazing time in Emulex's history. As I said, it was 30 years old. It was going through a really rough patch in the industry it was in. And mm -hmm. Paul said, let's focus on this fiber channel business. Mm -hmm. So he built a team with laser light focus. Mm -hmm. he, he, he drove this forward. And the company became a powerhouse in, in, in fiber channel, HBAs, and IO business. And, you know, the Emulex, you know, owes that transition to Paul and his focus there and the team he built. And um, you have succeeded him as CEO yes. uh, five years ago? Five now? years ago, yeah. And you brought in a new president from QLogic, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. His name is uh, Jeff Bank. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeff was a very senior executive at IBM. In fact, mm -hmm. he was a customer of mine. Okay. Of mine, uh, so you already back. know him. And then he left and went to Q. And after a year or so, I think he decided he, he needed to do something different. And before he could leave the county, I gave him a call and said, why don't you come to Emulex? I think you like it here. And uh, brought him on as, as CEO and now president. And mm -hmm. he's doing a great job. He runs all of our day-to-day -day operations, mm -hmm. you know, the sales, the marketing, engineering mm -hmm. operations. So Let's quickly talk about what's going on in Thailand. Uh, I know there's been a lot of flooding, and Western Digital, you mentioned, has been just decimated. Oh, yeah. Well, they've been front page on this stuff. And actually, we have uh, uh, a major contract manufacturer. We outsource all the right. manufacturing. And, and that contract manufacturer ended up under about eight feet of water as well, in the same neighborhood as WD. And, um, mm -hmm. But I'm blessed with having a, a really first-class supply chain guy uh, called John Warwick. And uh, he foresaw some of this coming down. And... First so you, of all, we moved our equipment to a higher floor. Cool. And then he had already, we, we had other sources of capacity in different countries. So he's been working over the last, and his team working the last couple of months moving so all of our equipment around and our, and our capacity. You're going to so be able to fulfill all your obligations? Yeah, we're feeling pretty good about it. That's good. Really good about it. So just fantastic uh, task. I mean, daunting, you know, uh, but they're working through it. Good. We only have two minutes left. So let's talk about how you, in my mind, you're following in uh, Paul's footsteps. I mean, Paul Foligno's involved with everything in Orange County, yeah. but you're really involved too, which is really great. What are some of the things you're involved with? Well, Paul and I had the same philosophy about the, both personally and from a company perspective around uh, giving back to the community mm -hmm. you, you live in. My particular focus is on, you know, education mm -hmm. and uh, making sure we've got the talent coming through or, whether it's our, 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 our K through 12, or high school, or, or university system. So, and whether that's in math, or science, or, or even um, music and the arts, you know, which is getting really hard hit these days in, yes. in school budgets, yes. is, is giving back there. So both the company, and I believe in uh, leading by example, so mm -hmm. I personally spend a lot of time with, with, with various organizations that they're either helping with the education of our kids mm -hmm. on math, which is like the Mind Research Institute. Ted Smith from Ted Filenet. Smith, Filenet. Very involved in that. Phenomenal stuff. They, they in school districts have doubled the proficiency of, uh, Test of the kids. Way, up. way, way up. Mm -hmm. um, above the national averages. So um, really pleased to be part of that. Uh, I do work through the Pacific Symphony, uh, mm -hmm. particularly focused on education and getting mm -hmm. that the musicians out to schools and things mm -hmm. like that. And um, I'm on the chief executive roundtable, which is a support group for UC Irvine, you 
And I believe you're the chairman of that currently. Chairman. And that's all about connecting the business community with UCI mm -hmm. and getting an exchange of ideas, uh, you know, looking, making sure we've got the talent, uh, bringing, uh, letting UCI know what industry needs mm -hmm. uh, in, in the talent of tomorrow. And so. the engineering school has a new dean. I know you're involved with that. And yep. they're very, this new dean is uh, very involved in Very involved in outreach and technology transfer. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good. hoping for big things there. And finally, you just joined the board of uh, about a year ago of PBS SoCal? Yeah. Well, well it was KOCE -E at the time. Yeah. And then they picked up the PBS franchise for uh, Southern California. You get there and, boy, things happen. Boy, things really happen. And Mel's doing a great job there and actually is putting, helping put Orange County on the map. It is great. It is great. Uh, our gain is Los Angeles' loss, I guess. Thank you so much for being a guest today. You know, your career has really gotten you into wonderful places and you've gotten to work with just great people. Quite and interesting people. We're yeah. so glad that you made the journey from Scotland to, to Orange County. Love being here. It's a great well, place. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thanks, Richard. The Cable Business Journal is brought to you by Cox Communications, your local cable operator, and the Orange County Business Journal. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you again for joining me uh, for the show. Have fun. Thank you.